If you will, turn uh, with me to that passage that was read in, in Genesis chapter 28. I read a story sometime last fall about Banksy, who's the arguably the most notorious street artist um, in the world. His, his paintings have, or he's actually remained anonymous for the last 20 years. No one knows who he is. But last fall, one of his paintings of a girl holding, I think it was a red balloon or, or holding a balloon, it, it sold at a London auction for $1.4 million dollars. But after his auction of, or after the auction of this painting, it began to self-destruct. Literally, there was a shredder at the bottom of the frame, and after the person who bought this $1.4 million piece of art, he watched it self-destruct. And underneath the shredder, there was this quote from Picasso that said, this, the urge to destroy is also a creative urge. I thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like your response, you're thinking, wow, $1.4 million down the drain. And I thought about that. I, I, I feel like for most of us in here, we can kind of relate to how that buyer felt on some level. Where you've invested time and money and energy into this thing only to have it self-destruct. Only to leave you with dissatisfaction. To where you've poured yourself into something and it hasn't met your expectation but it's only left you feeling disappointment and sorrow, and sadness. And oftentimes when we have these moments of self-destruction, where our expectations haven't been met, where there's sorrow and sadness, where that thing that we've put our effort into, our money, our time, our energy, our soul, and it hasn't done for us what we thought, we can kind of go into some sort of existential crisis where we begin to question whether or not life has meaning. We begin to question whether we as just individuals matter in this kind of grand scheme of thing called life. And if you're spiritual, you begin to question where God is in the midst of the aftermath. You begin to, you begin to question, God, why are you allowing this thing to happen? You have this existential crisis. Where is God in the midst of my failure, my sin, the ways in which I self-destruct? And in our passage this morning, Jacob is in the midst of an existential crisis. He's despairing. He's full of great disappointment and confusion and what's really remarkable about this particular narrative, this particular episode in the life of Jacob, is that God begins to do a beautiful process of restoration. And so before we consider this process of restoration in the life of Jacob, let's pray and ask God to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. So Lord Jesus, would you then by your grace, attend to all of our hearts, minds, and souls. Would you give us this morning eyes to see and ears to hear? Would you send us your Holy Spirit to comfort us, to encourage us, to feed us, and to build us up? Would you be so kind to do that for your people? For we pray, Jesus, all this in your name. Amen. So, who is Jacob? If you're unfamiliar with this, um, this character in the Old Testament, Jacob is the younger brother, the other twin brother of Esau. 
In Jacob's entire life, he's had one goal, and that is to win his father's affection. His father Isaac. All Jacob wanted his whole life was for his father Isaac to notice him. <laughs> he just wanted Isaac's face to shine on him. But Isaac always preferred Esau. Isaac always doted on Esau. He was the favorite child in his household. And so Jacob just kind of lived in the shadow of his older brother. But in order to kind of win his father's affection, Jacob did something um, pretty deceitful uh, that ended up destroying his family. He, uh, his mother Rebecca and him devised a plan to somehow convince Isaac, who's at this particular moment in life, he's, he's going blind and he's dying, to give Jacob the deathbed blessing or the firstborn blessing, which was a big deal in the ancient Near East. And so Jacob and Rebekah come up with this plan, and it's a ridiculous plan. That is, he's going to dress up like Esau, and he's going to deceive his dad into giving him the deathbed blessing. So that's what he does. He dresses up like his older brother, and somehow convinces Isaac, who's blind and dying, that he is Esau, and so Isaac blesses him. But then, of course, the plan self-destructs, right? <laughs> um, Isaac finds out that Jacob is not Esau, and Esau finds out what has happened. Isaac is furious, and Esau wants to kill his younger brother, and so Jacob has to flee. And what's so sad about this whole episode is that the one person who actually loved him, who cared for him, his mother, Rebecca, this is the last time that Jacob would ever see her alive again. This is the context of the story that was read. Jacob is on the run. And he's going to see some family in Haran. He's left Beersheba, and he's on his way to Haran. And that's where we meet Jacob in Genesis 28, verses 10 and following. So what do we learn? And what I want to do this morning is I, I want to look at three things from this passage. I want to see, first, that life is broken. Secondly, things are not always as they seem. And then third, the hope of heaven's gate. Life is broken. Things are not always as they seem, and the hope of heaven's gate. First, life is broken. Verses 10 and 11 give us kind of the overall condition of where Jacob is, emotionally, spiritually, physically, psychologically. And the narrator is doing a masterful job with very succinct details about Jacob's condition. Notice what we learn. We first learn that he's tired. Jacob is utterly exhausted. The distance between Beersheba and Haran is 500 miles. This is a tumultuous journey. And the narrator tells us that literally Jacob just stopped and decided to stay there. Literally, he stopped in the middle of nowhere because he's just exhausted. He's emotionally tired, physically drained. But we also see that he's alone. Jacob has no friends with him. He's utterly traveling this 500-mile journey with no fellow companions. But he's defenseless. Did you notice this very strange detail that the narrator put that he took a stone as a pillow to lay his head on? Now, why would anyone... <laughs> Use a stone. I don't, know, I don't know the last time you tried to lay on a rock, but I don't know if I could fall asleep. Which suggests what? That he literally left his house with absolutely nothing. He's utterly penniless. He has zero possessions, which means that he's defenseless in this desert wasteland, which is a very risky enterprise. But then the narrator kind of sums up, I think, which is emblematic of Jacob's overall condition where he says that he stayed there because the sun had set. 
In other words, there's just darkness over Jacob's overall condition. Jacob's having, as one poet described, a dark night of the soul. Life is not going as he expected. That when he began to survey his life, the only conclusion that Jacob could come up with is this. My life is broken. From all of the poor decisions that have led to the ways in which I have self-destructed, Jacob's life is utterly broken. And here's my question. Have, have you experienced that lately? Where you've run up against the reality in your own life, when you've taken inventory, when you've begun to survey your own life, have you run up against the reality that your life is broken, where it leaves you in a place like Jacob is, utterly confused, totally devastated, and on the verge of despair? I mean, think about it. You fall in love, you have found that person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And you marry that person only for that person then to lose interest and to leave you. Or for you college students at UCSB in Westmont, you showed up, you made a couple of new friends, you felt like, you know what? I think I can do this college thing only to realize that you're now back on the outside looking in and those friends that you thought that you made have muted you. And now you're alone, spending most nights in your dorm room by yourself. Or to the young couple who is married, who wants to expand their family and they just suffer disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. Or to the person who decided this new year made, made the resolution like, this is going to be the year where I'm going to have a renewed interest in Jesus and the gospel. When you came up with a reading plan, like, I'm going to get more disciplined in my prayer life because you, you realize, like, this is what I need. And what you've, it, it, and part of the reason is because you're like, I, I need to have a better relationship with Jesus because this is going to make my life easier. <laughs> and what you've discovered is, is that life hasn't gotten easier. The struggles haven't lessened. They've only intensified. And you thought that this Christian life that was actually going to give you something of comfort and ease has actually made your life more difficult. You've run up against the reality that life is broken. And what happens is that we can begin to think of our life in two different ways. Or we, we can begin to believe two different things about God. That God is inactive and that God is indifferent. Jacob believed in God, and he believed that God had promised him this great blessing, this great inheritance, that the older would serve the younger. But instead, Jacob is asking, where are you, God? Why have you allowed this to happen? Why have you not come through with your promise? You see, Jacob began to believe that God was inactive, which ultimately leads to to believing that God is indifferent. For Jacob, every previous generation had, had these amazing encounters with God. Moses, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. They, they had all had these wonderful encounters with God. And Jacob's thinking, you know what? If I haven't encountered God before I lied and cheated and stolen and deceived my family. There's no way I'm going to have this encounter with God now. God simply doesn't care. He's indifferent to where I am in my current station in life. And boy, do we feel that when we run up against the reality that life is broken. Where we begin to believe that God is not at work. And that God just simply does not care for where I am in this particular part 
of my life. Jacob is utterly alone. And what's fascinating about this story is that he never once cries out to God. It's as almost if Jacob got to this place in the middle of Nowheresville and decided to give up on life. That's where he is. Utterly broken. But things are not always as they seem. Things are not always as they seem. Somehow Jacob falls asleep on this rock. And he has this dream. And what's so great about this dream is that Jacob, he sees three things and he hears three things. What does he see? The first thing that he sees is a staircase. Oftentimes this is translated as a ladder, but it's not a ladder. It's an actual stair. It's a massive staircase, a huge ramp that extends from earth all the way to heaven. And what does he see? He sees angels ascending and descending on this massive staircase that is stretched from heaven to earth. Angels, these royal beings doing the business of the king. He sees them, this is legions of angels doing the work of the king. But then he also sees God standing over him. The text tells us that it was God standing over it, but a better translation is that God was standing over Jacob. That God stood over him in a posture of nearness and intimacy. This is what he sees in his dream, in the midst of his brokenness. But he also hears three things. What does he hear? Verses 14 and 15. There's this central refrain that says, I am the Lord. And anytime you see Lord in all caps, that is God's personal covenant name that he gives to his people. So there's, there's this central refrain attached to, I am the Lord. And Jacob hears these three promises. One, I am with you. Jacob, who is utterly alone in the middle of Nowheresville, hears God say, Jacob, I am the Lord. I am with you. But he also hears, behold, I am the Lord. I will keep you. The one who is penniless, the one who has no inheritance, the one who literally has no defenses, hears the Lord say, Jacob, I'm going to keep you. I will sustain you. I'm going to protect you. But then he hears, behold, I am the Lord. I will bless you. You know that promise that I gave to you? He says, I'm going to keep it. Because I'm a God who always keeps his promises. I am with you. I will keep you and I will bless you. Things are not always as they seem. What's so remarkable about this is that we're getting a glimpse of the unveiled reality of heaven for a moment. And what Jacob learns is that he's been wrong about God the whole time. God is not inactive and he's not indifferent. Actually, God is very active, standing over Jacob in a posture of nearness and intimacy. And he's disclosing to Jacob heaven's activity on his behalf. Jacob just couldn't sense it. He didn't know it. He's been with Jacob the whole time, even though Jacob hadn't seen it or realized it came across a really fascinating adoption story on ESPN magazine. It's a story about Dylan McCullough. Dylan, uh, his birth mother um, got pregnant at the age of 16 and she decided to give him up for adoption. Not because she didn't want him or because she didn't love him, but she at 16 had no resources to take care of him or the maturity to raise a baby. And so she gives Dylan up for adoption. But something you need to know about the birth mother is that she never told 
the man who got her pregnant that she was pregnant. So the man who impregnated her was off on a football scholarship and she didn't want to wreck his future you know, career as a football player. So she never told anyone who the birth father was. She only told a couple people that she was pregnant. So she gives Dylan up for adoption and he grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, not far from his birth mother. And Dylan actually got a scholarship to play football and made it to the NFL, but a Injury to his knee kind of ended his career, so he went into coaching, largely because he was inspired by his college coach, a guy by the name of Sherman Smith. Sherman Smith was the most well-beloved coach on, um, on his college team. Sherman used to tell his players this. He said, you may not be looking for a father, but I'm going to treat you like a son, which I love. It's a great coach line. That's who Sherman Smith was. He was just loved by all the players. And it inspired Dylan to want to get into coaching because of his interaction with Sherman Smith. Dylan gets married, and they start having a family. And as he's having a family, he starts thinking about his birth parents. And so he goes through the process of investigating who his birth mom and dad are. And through a, a string of all kinds of different things, he ends up finding her on Facebook, reaches out to her, and introduces himself and says, hey, I would like to verify whether or not you're my birth mom. And so they arrange a phone call. And at this time in his career, he's coaching at USC. And so he calls this lady who he thinks is mom. They verify the details. And after they verify that, like, yes, you're my birth mom, he says, I need to know who my birth dad is. And she's never told to anyone, but she said, I knew that I needed to tell him. Your birth dad is Sherman Smith. His college football coach. And what's remarkable about this is that Dylan met Sherman Smith at the age of 16. And he took a picture with Sherman Smith at the age of 16 and he said, I've never been without that picture my entire life from that day forward. Every dorm room, every hotel, every mantle that, of the house that we've lived in, there's that picture of me and Sherman Smith, the man who I've looked up to my entire life and who I've always wanted to be. Here's the thing. Deland was looking for a father and Sherman Smith was treating him like a son the whole time. His father was with him and his father was for him and Deland didn't know it at the time. And what I want you to understand and see this morning and believe is that just because you don't see God at work or sense his presence doesn't mean that he's not at work and he's not, at, he's not present. We as finite human beings have a very limited perspective on our circumstances. And yet God, who is infinite and has an unlimited perspective because he's omniscient. Now, can we sometimes make sense of our brokenness? Yeah? Sometimes we can see the contours of God's grace at work in our lives, but oftentimes we can't. And what this text is showing us is that God is always active and that he is not indifferent to our broken and messy lives. How do I know that God is always active and that he is not indifferent? Well, it's because of the hope of heaven's gate. Jacob's response after this dream is, is fear and trembling. And he says that this place, this place is the gate of heaven. And that's kind of a reference to a previous story in Genesis chapter 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, where people are building a staircase to the heavens, making sacrifices to gods along the way. And Jacob says, no, no, no. What he saw was the complete opposite. He saw a staircase from heaven reaching to earth and God coming down to pursue us. 
Christianity is not us pursuing God. Christianity is actually God pursuing us. And if anything, Christianity is unique in this against all other religions. Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, think about it. They all have these systems where you have to keep the five pillars or keep the law or follow the steps in order to reach their gods. But Christianity is utterly unique because it is God who comes down and pursues us. There's this great exchange in the New Testament where Nathanael is doubting whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. You can read about this in John chapter 1. Nathanael's doubting that Jesus is who he says he is. And all of a sudden, Jesus begins to tell Nathanael certain things about his life. (laughs) Which would be really uncomfortable if some stranger came up to you and said, I know what you did last night. That got Nathanael's attention. As it would anyone. And he's utterly shocked and surprised at it. And Jesus says to Nathanael, he's like, look, if you are impressed with that, you're going to see greater things. For truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened up. And you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You will see heaven opened up. And you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I am Jacob's staircase. I am God in the flesh coming to pursue you in your brokenness, in your failures, in your sorrow, in your suffering, in your pain. Things are not as they seem. Jesus says you will see greater things. What is he talking about? He's predicting his death. Jesus is saying one day I will end up on this cross, utterly alone, defenseless. Darkness will cover the land. And I will take on myself all the ways in which you have self-destructed in this world. I will take on myself all your sin and shame and sorrow and pain. Because that's the kind of God that I am. I'm a God who pursues you in your brokenness. Things are not as they seem because the cross of Christ is foolishness to the world. We see that our God is not indifferent. That he is not inactive to our broken and fallen world. He literally knows what it's like to experience the dark night of the soul. Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension is the picture of God coming in grace to pursue and rescue us in our broken and fallen and messed up world. That is the hope of heaven's gate. So what do we do with this? Two things. One, God's grace always comforts us. Jacob's encounter with God was unsought, unexpected, and undeserved. He wasn't looking for God. He never once cried out to God for mercy or for guidance or for anything. He was a liar, a cheat, a thief. He was a deceiver. And yet God stands over Jacob and there's not a word of condemnation. Derek Kidner, an Old Testament scholar, put it like this. He said, God's divine grace was unstinted. There was no word of reproach or demand, only a stream of assurances flowing from the central I am the Lord, to spread from the past all the way to the future. God isn't saying to Jacob, try harder, do better, have more faith. No, it's words of comfort, words of grace, words of his blessed assurance over his life. God comes to Jacob at his lowest point to meet him in his sin and sorrow And begins to restore him. In other words, God is attracted to our brokenness and our weakness. He's attracted to our lowest points in life. 
God stands over him in a posture of nearness and intimacy. Don't you want to know a God like that? God's grace always comforts us, but God's grace helps reframe our sorrow. God standing over Jacob in the midst of his lowest point in life, and it reveals a picture of hope in the midst of sorrow. And the hope is this, that because God wrote himself into the story of redemption, it means that he wrote wrote our pain and sorrow upon himself. God pursuing us in Jesus, it helps reframe our sorrow. Does it always explain it? No. But it helps reframe it when we see it in light of the big picture of God's gospel. God's grace helps reframe our sorrow, which means it's a call to trust God. To rest in the assurance that in Christ, that if you're in Christ, He stands over you in a posture of nearness and intimacy because harnessed to His grace is His steadfast love. So I would invite you this morning to trust the God who stands over you in the midst of your sin and sorrow. Lean into him and know that he is always at work. And he cares for where you are right now in whatever particular season you're in. It's a call to trust him. Consider that an invitation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that life is hard and broken. And that all of us run up against it every single day. And what we need most in this life is for you to come alongside and whisper to us that you are for us, that you love us, that you're not indifferent. So Lord, would you, by your grace, come into it and come and attend to where all of our hearts are this morning. Would you do that? For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.